Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Felberg. I'm with the Yale School of Management. Um, I think we've got a great panel to wrap up the day here um, and get, get, get you on to the reception. Uh, we're here to talk about designing effective regulatory sandboxes. Um, I, I took one of Brian's writings to define what a regulatory sandbox is, a temporary testing environment where certain approved firms are able to experiment with innovative business models, products, or services with some combination of reduced regulatory burdens, safe harbors, increased communication with regulators, and expedited decisions. So that's, that, that's what we mean by a sandbox, if anybody's wondering. Um, that covers a lot of ground, and we're going to hear about that in the, in, in the, from the speakers. Um, we, we hadn't thought, but we just learned from Martin that there's another model where the whole country becomes the sandbox in China. I don't think that model is going to work anywhere else, especially not in the U.S., but that was an interesting example we just learned about. Um, so I, I used to work for the, at the Fed. I was a regulator. Um, in the old days, you know, if you had a new product, you would just talk to your regulator, talk to your lawyer. You'd probably work it out pretty easily. Um, maybe some guidance would show up in five or six years. Um, but things are a lot different with the fintech revolution, just the speed of development, the number of new technologies. It's a lot to process. The regulators aren't always sure themselves how to interpret their rules with new stuff they haven't seen before. Um, so we're looking for some way to regulators to learn more about what's going on, and we're looking for some way for firms to feel more comfortable that what they're doing will um, can, can go on without being, being canceled at some point. Um, still, there have been a few broad objections to sandboxes, which we're going to talk about today. One is the kind of consumer legal objection that you're protecting um, an activity from rules even for a short amount of time. There's the competition objection, which, which um, is that they might help some firms over others. There's the tool for the job objection that maybe there's, um, there's some other way to do this if we want to get financial inclusion happening. Maybe there's better ways to do it. And then there's the U.S. can't do this objection, which is that a country with 50 regulators can't possibly have one place where you, um, where you can be protected from regulation even for, um, for a minute. So um, we, we've got a great panel. Like I said, we've got Sean Duff, who's a senior fellow at the Aspen Institute, um, Brian Knight from George Mason, um, Dan Kwan from Bank Street Advisory and McKinsey, who used to work at CFPB, and Nat Hoops, who's with the Marketplace Lending Association. So we're going to have Sean go first um, to describe a massive survey that he's just completed with CGAP and the World Bank, which covers, I think, 30 different countries sandbox experiments. Thank you all. Thank you, Philadelphia Fed, for having us. And um, it's a real pleasure to share the stage with these um, sandbox experts. Um, I feel like I've been thinking about this topic for a long time. I'm the uh, child actor of, of uh, regulatory sandboxes and hope, uh, hope we can move beyond to, to more interesting topics at some point. Um, so before we sort of, um, I think, get into what will be a fairly lively debate, um, pros and cons of sandboxes and their, their prospects here in the United States, I did want to just share some some uh, some preliminary data, uh, preliminary insights that have come out of a, of a recent CGAP and World Bank study on uh, innovation facilitators. So this includes both sandbox innovation hubs and, and uh, regulator-sponsored accelerators. Um, it will seem not very academic to, to this crowd, um, but it's, it's at least indicative and gives us some kind of early insights into how these programs are shaping up um, uh, around the world. So there were. Uh, just to sort of set the table here, 62 um, regulators were uh, contacted for this study. 31 responded, um, kind of a mix of common law and civil law countries, a uh, mix of single peak and multi peak regulatory environments. So it's an interesting cross section of countries that are working with sandboxes. Um, uh, the U.S. is not included um, in, 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 the, in these data, um, but, uh, but I, you know, ho hopefully it will give us some interesting tool for our, um, our fodder for our conversation. Um, first sort of basic insight, and you probably can't see these, uh, the, the words too closely, but on the, on the left side, um, uh, you can see what, what regulators identify as barriers to innovation in, in their particular jurisdictions, and there's sort of a laundry list. The interesting thing here is that legal uncertainty and regulatory restraints are identified by regulators, central bankers and prudential regulators, as being barriers to the development of their fintech uh, ecosystems. Um, at the same time, uh, they'll say that uh, lack of human resources um, uh, and lack of technical knowledge are, 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 are big drivers of their inability to respond to changes in the marketplace. So on the one hand, they feel like 
gosh, the, 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 the extant regulatory environment doesn't really allow new technologies to emerge. And on the other hand, we as regulators don't really have the technical capacity to, 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 to deal with those issues. And therein is sort of the basic instinct of a, of a sandbox or an innovation hub or some, some such to bring the market and the regulatory uh, community in, in closer contact with one another, uh, share information and insights, um, and evolve the regulatory um, environment appropriately. So that's kind of the, the instinct which you would all sort of intuit um, without this slide probably. <laughs> um, this is sort of the, the obligatory global regulatory sandbox scan. It's a little bit dated, um, but there are about fif between 50 and 60 different sandbox projects globally. Uh, there's some jurisdictions with multiple regulatory sandboxes. Um, you know, Thailand, for example, I think has three. Hong Kong does as well. Uh, there's an interesting question there for us later uh, on the panel to talk about how sandbox activities are coordinated across uh, multi-regulator environments. Um, but just to give you a sense that um, you know, this is a very hot topic. It's not slowing down. If anything, we've experienced regulators, particularly in emerging markets, finding that sandboxes are something that they have to have. Um, and it's almost the, you know, we talk about FMOC uh, here. It's really FMO, uh, FOMO in emerging markets, fear of missing out. Um, and no real slides that's showing down. Um, the next two slides give us kind of an early look into the type of uh, uh, companies and technologies that are participating in sandboxes. This is, um, reflects um, about 190 different sandbox uh, uh, participants globally uh, that have been surveyed uh, by CGAP and the World Bank and kind of grouping them by, uh, by sector, right? I mean, I think the, and you, you can kind of see the, uh, the, the breakdown there, but I think the interesting um, high level point is wholesale and infrastructure, this kind of broad catch-all category is really sort of B2B type of uh, FinTech um, innovations. There might be uh, API gateways. Um, there are um, uh, platforms for, for trading and uh, uh, crypto assets, crypto wallets and so forth. So it's really sort of market infrastructure up in that upper left-hand quadrant. And the rest is, um, is, is largely uh, retail financial services. Uh, we tried to do a, a look by, you know, type of technology that was being tested in sandboxes and, you know, unsurprisingly blockchain and crypto um, comprise a large, uh, a large segment of the kind of profile technologies. Um, there are, uh, you know, this, th th this great catch-all category, other, where people don't actually do necessarily define the type of technology that they're testing. I actually think that's an interesting indicator um, because to me it says that th some of these companies are doing uh, work other than, you know, grabbing uh, words from the fintech word cloud and saying, you know, blockchain enabled X or AI enabled Y. They're actually kind of trying to solve kind of tangible business problems um, in some sense. Um, now here's getting into a little bit more of the kind of controversial points. I'm sure Brian will jump in on this one um, later. Um, you know, interestingly, we see a mismatch in some sense between a regulator's motivation uh, for launching a sandbox and their actual mandate to do so. Um, so we see you know, lots of regulators pointing to driving competition um, and encouraging innovation in the marketplace, uh, but very few actually have a, a, a direct competition mandate. Um, my own pet theory on this is that the FCA in the UK, which is of course, you know, th their regulatory sandbox project is almost synonymous with the, um, with the concept does have an express competition mandate um, and it gives their sandbox a little bit of a different flavor. Um, but the, the, the point here is there, there's sort of a background question that how far regulators can really go in using sandboxes to, to promote innovation versus solving narrower regulatory um, problems. Um, this is a, you know, a, a narrow observational point, but it's a question of eligibility. You know, who, who is uh, allowed to participate in the sandbox? Um, we find that, that, that most uh, jurisdictions surveyed uh, allow their sandbox to be open to both um, incumbents, uh, so regulated financial entities, and uh, startups or innovators or un un unregulated, um, uh, unlicensed um, entities. So in theory, at least, it's open to all, most sandboxes are open to all comers. As a practical matter, you don't see incumbents participating um, very much. Um, th this slide gets at sort of w one of the objections that we might talk about later on the panel, which is whether uh, sandboxes create, create loopholes or they create a free pass 
to operate in the marketplace with really without uh, any sort of regulatory oversight. Um, you know, there's one way of reading this to say, look, m most sandboxes do have some sort of consumer protection feature built in, whether it's disclosure or um, express complaint handling mechanisms and so forth. Um, most do, but then you get the, you know, the, the, the odd results here where uh, you know, less than 50% um, you know, have AML CFT compliance uh, uh, requirements built into their um, kind of sandbox activity. Um, uh, and fewer still have, have minimum capital requirements. Um, so again, probably a point for discussion on, on the panel, whether we see sandboxes doing enough to protect consumer protection, maybe even financial stability um, um, through their experiments. Um, so the question is kind of, if not sandboxes, what else can we do to sort of address that initial instinct that, that the market's evolving quickly, Regulators don't necessarily feel comfortable or have the capacity to engage on a technical level, um, and there's still sort of a gap between uh, market innovators and, 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 and regulatory staff. Um, and I think, you know, w one answer to that is you know, don't do sandboxes. Do something like an innovation hub, a fintech office, um, a hotline, something to enable that informal channel of communication uh, to, to, um, to exist and to flow. Um, but without necessarily all the infrastructure of setting up a sandbox. Sean, for the audience that's not familiar, can you explain what an innovation hub and an innovation Yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think there's no uh, crisp definition of either, but, uh, the, you know, the basic idea, and actually Dan should probably t talk about this distinction because he, he sat in one of these, in, in an informal seat in some sense. Um, but the way I think about both of those uh, concepts is, is having a, a dedicated person or staff um, who can be a point of contact for the industry. Um, and that can be both, you know, active outreach and, uh, and, and, and passive, kind of taking inbound inquiries um, to help, uh, you know, help think about regulatory challenges that innovators might be facing. And there's sort of a, you know, a heavyweight version of that where you put a lot of, lot of programming and resources into, um, you know, promoting the sector. Uh, and then there's a, a, a lightweight version of that, which is simply a, an internal resource within the regulator. Um, but the obvious point here you can see um, is, you know, Innovation Hub obviously has a great deal more activity, a great deal more points of contact with the industry than, than sandboxes do globally. Um, that sort of intuitively makes sense, right? If you're, you're calling into a number or going to have an informal conversation about your business, that's a lighter touch, uh, lower transaction cost um, interaction than applying to a formal program. But it's still interesting to, to note that, you know, how much more activity there is through these more informal, less structured programs. And then if there was a, again, maybe this is a, a, a point for Brian to take up, um, you know, one interesting reason on the right, you, you talk to regulators about why they rejected uh, companies from either innovation hubs or sandbox programs. There is this odd response that the, the applicant was not genuinely innovative. Um, so, so, so query what that means um, a, as a practical matter. And that obviously the question behind the question is the, the degree of regulatory discretion um, that you want to hand over to, um, to to folks managing sandbox programs in terms of who gets in and um, and who's excluded. Um, again, this is sort of the, the same point in a different way, where regulators themselves, you look at the bottom line there, um, view uh, the guidance, uh, the informal guidance uh, uh, given as as sort of the sandbox's um, greatest benefit. Um, so not granting waivers, not granting regulatory exemptions, not regulatory modernization. Uh, it's really the question of, uh, you know, providing that sort of light touch informal guidance to the marketplace um, being kind of the primary benefit um, of, of these programs. Um, and then a final point here, and we, we can lead into, uh, you know, I think there's, there's lots of talk about what the future of sandboxes look like. Um, you know, when we think of sandboxes, we think of the, the, the FCAs, uh, the Financial Conduct Authorities, uh, kind of high throughput, cohort-based, almost accelerator-like um, uh, competition promoting sandbox. That was sort of the, the first iteration. But there are other um, models that we see emerging around the world. Um, there's the, the monetary, sort of monetary Authority of Singapore's uh, policy promoting sandbox. This is how they, they talk about it where the sandbox is really intended to just, just resolve edge cases, where they have enough different programs for engaging with the marketplace, um, a fairly flexible, responsive um, regulatory environment generally, that the sandbox is really only used in those cases where they need actual 
uh, almost experimental data to understand which way to, you know, to, to, to toggle a, a licensing decision. And then finally, these thematic sandboxes, and this is actually just personally where I think sandboxes will, will end up in, in version 2.0, which is regulators using sandboxes much more, um, in, a, in a much more targeted way to gather and collect evidence on specific regulatory hypotheses. Um, so we see uh, a number of countries experimenting with thematic sandboxes around what we call regulatory enablers, right? EKYC programs, QR code programs, I think um, uh, you know, increasingly around uh, the use of AI and mach machine learning to generate um, uh, uh, credit decisioning and so forth. So I think we'll see one, <laughs> column one, innovation promoting sandboxes kind of transitioning to more thematic sandboxes over time. And then maybe even the hydraulic impact of that changing the nature of how we think about uh, regulating digital financial services generally. Um, I'll stop there and hand off to whoever my colleagues is next. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jalapa, for, for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm honored to be here. I wanted to talk about, um, and, and, and Sean did a great job uh, of, of teeing all this up, but I want to talk about a, uh, you know, sandboxes and a, what, what I would argue is something of a par an inherent paradox in their design. And so this, is, this presentation is based off of a paper that's in process with me and a, a student at GMU Law, Trace Mitchell. Um, so very briefly, one of the nice things about having your definition of sandbox used at the very beginning is you don't have to worry that someone's going to use a different definition. Um, most common in the area of fintech, but, but regulatory sandboxes exist in other areas. Um, and, and you can argue that some things that are not called sandboxes exhibit some of the features like drug testing. Uh, goal is often to promote, to promote entrepreneurialism and innovation. Sometimes there is a, sort of an explicit industrial policy element to it of we want to be the place where innovative firms come and set up shop and in, in you know underneath that is that means that the jobs come here that means that the tax revenues come here uh, each regulatory sandbox differs in its design uh, it's going to differ based upon the goals of the um, you know, the, the jurisdiction is going to differ d based on the powers that the individual administering regulator has and on the scope of, the, of their jurisdiction, what type of companies and what type of transactions fall under their ambit. Uh, existing regulatory sandboxes, I think mine is even more outdated than yours. Uh, <laughs> UK launched the first sandbox in June of 2016. Shortly thereafter, Singapore and Australia moved on or, or, or created theirs. In the United States, Arizona is the first state to have a, a sandbox uh, established. <coughs> Wyoming and Utah have subsequently stood up their own, and the CFPB has finalized its uh, <coughs> compliance assistance sandbox internal regulation. Attributes sandboxes generally, uh, generally speaking, and we're going to talk about some exceptions, they're gated, right? You have to apply to participate in the sandbox which means that the regulator gets to exercise discretion as to who it lets in and who it lets out. <laughs> they tend to have requirements for a limited time duration or number or type of customers that you can service. So it isn't a case of once in the sandbox, always in the sandbox, just go forth. You're seeing limits that range, time limits that range from three to six months to two to three years. There's frequently a limit as to the number of consumers that can, uh, access the, the tested product or the amount of value that can be transacted or who, what type of consumers can actually access them. There are some sandboxes where you're allowed to, uh, to serve, where, where deemed under the rules of the jurisdiction, something like sophisticated consumers, but you're not allowed to just service retail or you're allowed to service an unlimited number of sophisticated consumers and a fixed number of retail consumers. Um, very frequently, the relief involves allowing limited access to the market without a license. And that, that makes sense. If, if you view these as testing environments, 
getting the license is one of the most difficult, expensive, time-consuming things you have to do. So if you have a product and you, know, you think it works and you think it's legal, but you're not entirely certain, you could either go and spend the time and effort and money to go get a full-blown license and try it out and hope that the product's legal and hope that the product actually works when you test it on real people. But the sandbox, some of these sandboxes are there to let you have what amounts to a learner's permit where you can try it out for a limited period of time on a limited number of people in a limited regulatory environment, see if it works. If it does, and if it's deemed legal, then you can go and you can get the full license with, with confidence. If it doesn't work, either because it just turns out the product doesn't work or there are, there's legal questions about it, you're not out the time and effort and expense of going to get the full license. <coughs> Uh, the type of relief is going to depend on the authorities and jurisdiction of the administering regulator. So to contrast Arizona, which is a licensing body, they license lenders, they license money transmitters. And if you look at their sandbox, the primary relief is that learner's permit style license. Contrast them with the CFPB, who does not license, is not a licensing or chartering body. They are a consumer protection conduct regulator. And so their relief revolves very much around sort of a pre-vetting of conduct coupled with a, a regulatory self safe harbor for conduct that they approve. The CFPB couldn't give you a license even if they wanted to, they just lack that jurisdiction. Frequently, there is an information sharing requirement, you know, and, and, and John, John's research I think very ably shows this. Part of what the regulators try to get out of the sandbox, right, they're not doing this just out of the goodness of their heart. They want to know, well, what's going on? Where is the market going? What's technology doing? How is this working? And so the way the sandbox helps that is there is, there is an understanding and a requirement of, okay, if you enter the sandbox firm and you get this regulatory self safe harbor or these regulatory uh, provisions, you need to give us information. You need to give us robust information, more than you would necessarily have to give us if you were just kind of operating on your own. The firm very much puts itself on the regulator's radar. It, it in effect, frequently becomes what amounts to a, a supervised firm. Now, uh, the Australians are a little different. Uh, their version uh, or the, their, uh, the Australian Securities Investment Commission has a, a, a tool within their sandbox that allows for certain firms to basically just not get a license for the first two years. And you don't have to get approved by the ASIC before you get to take advantage of it. It's, you basically put the ASIC on notice, hey, we're taking advantage, we qualify, and we're taking advantage of this. And then the disclosures and all that stuff and the review happens at the end. And the difference though is, or one of the differences is, the criteria for taking advantage of this is very prescriptive and relatively narrow. So the ASIC puts a lot, there are a lot of requirements to qualify for this, but if you meet them, then you don't have, the ASIC doesn't have to, to prospectively bless you, they retrospectively make certain you in fact qualified. Uh, now at this last, I believe, two years, but you can get an exemption or an addition from the ASIC, but in that case, it looks more like the other sandboxes where it is a discretionary grant on the part of the regulator. CFPB uh, finalized their um, sandbox, requires an application, it, you know, so there is a discretionary grant, provides regulatory approval for acts that the CFPB deems to be lawful under ACOA, TILA, and EFTA which are three laws that have provisions in them that allow the CFPB to effectively approve certain conduct and say, okay, look, you know, the, the, the requirements of the law do not apply to this conduct, uh, or at least some requirements of the law. Um, it provides a safe harbor from CFPB enforcement, and the, I, I would argue that the CFPB's view is that it provides a safe harbor from state and private action as well. And if you look at the, if you look at their proposal and then their final, they kind of play up that state and, and private pr uh, protection more in the proposed than in the final, but they don't say, look, we're, we're abandoning that. They, they, they kind of use some uh, 
weasel language is not the right word, but uh, <laughs> broad language. It's like, oh yes, this, this grants, this grants you know, a broad safe harbor, you know, as broad as legally possible. So uh, you know, I'm sure that if we had some AGs in here, they would say, yeah, that doesn't really apply. And you know what? That's what we have courts for. But uh, it, it, the CFPB does seem to be taking a position that it provides a broad safe harbor from, uh, from potential private or state litigation under these three laws. A uh, interesting wrinkle uh, is, uh, you know, you might make, I think you can make an argument that the SEC has a sandbox, at least for one company. The SEC recently provided a company called Paxos, which is a blockchain company, so you know, we know I was, you know I was gonna get that in there. We have a no action relief for, two, for a two year trial period where Paxos is trying out settlement of securities on a proprietary blockchain. Uh, the SEC uh, doesn't waive their authority and they don't say that, you know, they don't look at it and say, well, look, Paxos, what you're trying to do doesn't, isn't actually covered by the law anyway, so, so don't worry. And they don't say, well, you know what, Paxos, we, we renounce our authority over you. No, no, they, they maintain authority. They say, in effect, look, Paxos, if you do these limited tests with limited number of people over a limited period of time, we won't make you register. And we will not recommend any enforcement action on the basis of you not registering, even though the law requires you to register. It appears to rely solely on the SEC's prosecutorial discretion. And I kind of wonder if this is effectively a sandbox, right? You got limited time, limited duration, limited number of customers, uh, you know, discretionary relief. It looks kind of sandboxy to me. So, okay, great, sandboxes. Well, why do we care? Well, there are potential rewards, as has been previously mentioned. The potential for increased entrepreneurialism and innovation you have more legal certainty, you have heightened regulatory oversight of an emerging industry, which could be good or could be bad, but you know, at least for the regulators, they view it as a reward. It may uh, lead to lower, lower barriers to entry because new firms who maybe can't afford sophisticated counsel and you know, face regulatory uncertainty or can't afford or are uncertain about spending the money to go get a license, uh, this provides an on-ramp for them and potentially faster access to markets because you get your learner's permit in, in, in sandboxes where that is one of the means of regulatory relief, and you can try out your, your product and see if it works. But there are also risks. There are risks for potential consumer harm because, or, you know, the argument goes, you are waiving consumer protection law. You, you know, the consumer is not getting the full benefit of the law that was put in place for their protection. There are potentially safety and soundness issues, though, you know, if part of this is, if part of the nature of a sandbox is these are small scale experiments, it is unclear what safety and soundness issues might exist, but then again, to the extent that you're talking about, say, if a sandbox were to allow some essential infrastructure uh, plan to be sandboxed, maybe. Uh, systemic instability and decreased regulatory control are all are all concerns that have been, have been discussed. But the one that, that we want to focus on in our paper and that, that we've been talking about for a while is the risk to market competition that sandboxes may pose because of what we call the sandbox <coughs> paradox, which is for anyone to actually use your sandbox, you, the regulator, have to give them something valuable, right? There has to be something that's beneficial for them to actually want to go jump through the hoops deal with all of the enhanced uh, supervision and all of that. They have to get something out of it, a regulatory benefit. Well, any benefit you, the regulator, are granting to one market participant, you are arguably harming all of the other market participants who are not getting that benefit. And so do you have a scenario where in the name of enhanced innovation, enhanced market competition or whatever, you are in fact granting regulatory privilege to select firms and harming, the, harming at least the, the fairness of the market, if not, and potentially the competitiveness of the market. <coughs> now look, and this is not to say, you know, no one take away from this that I am anti-sandbox or anything like that. Uh, you know, there are risks to everything, but, but we want to just discuss this possibility. Now, potential sources of, of firm economic privilege. Uh, one, 
easier access to market. If, one, if you have two firms, one gets the learner's permit and starts to be able to service customers, the other is trapped in applying for licenses and all of that, potential advantage. Lower regulatory burdens might decrease their potential legal liability. Uh, you know, the, the informal guidance that Sean mentioned, I mean, you know, what do you, call, what do you call an authoritative source who gives you legal and regulatory guidance? Most of us call that a lawyer that you have to pay for, but what if you had the law firm of the Philadelphia Fed, right? You know, are the regulators ending up serving as lawyers and consultants to specific firms? And then some firm, you know, there's evidence that firms may actually, who go through a sandbox, get increased access to investment capital, which on the one hand, like, sounds great, right? Like, boy, you know, great, new firms getting investment capital. On the other hand, if the thing that lets firm A get the investment capital and not firm B is that they went through a government program, we have to wonder if that's a, if that's a case of government grant privilege and what, what do we think about that? Uh, you know, <laughs> time for the debate about a level playing field. Um, yeah, so why do we care? Well, first off, for, for many of us, economic, economic government grant privilege just feels intuitively unjust. It feels like it violates the rule of law. I mean, to, to harken back to the first panel of the day and Martin's excellent presentation on China, where these fintech firms are at a decided regulatory advantage over the incumbents and the Chinese government's like, yep, what are you gonna do about it, right? Are you gonna vote us out of office? Ha ha ha, no. <laughs> Economic privilege can also distort the market and actually end up harming competition. What if the, what if the investment dollars aren't going to the best firms, they're going to the best connected firms? and then you risk cronyism and regulatory capture. All right, well, so that was all very depressing. Now let's talk about some positives here. There are ways we think that you can mitigate this, this risk. First off, you can lower barriers to entry to the sandbox. One of the things that we want to particularly call out is the sort of the uh, requirement that a firm be genuinely innovative, right? On the one hand, you don't want, it, it, makes, it makes all the sense on earth not to let a firm that is doing a very basic, very standard, tried and true business model chew up scarce regulatory resources, right? Presumably there's a body of law and a body of, of guidance that you can point them towards and like, well, there's all your answers, you don't need this. What we worry about is the scenario where the firm, the, like the number two or number three firm trying out something innovative can't get in because, the, because one firm was a little bit quicker, right? So if you're the third blockchain firm you probably still have a bunch of questions. There are probably still a bunch of unknowns and regulatory uncertainty that you have to deal with. So, you know, depending on how the regulators define genuinely innovative, it can be, you know, too narrow such that there really is a massive first mover advantage. Uh, two, generally speaking, decreasing regulatory discretion and granting entry. I mean, th and this is the challenge, right? In a world of limited regulatory resources, there has to be some discretion, but how do you cabinet? Um, try not to treat firm, like one, one other concern that, that I've, I neglected to mention is, is a sort of fir worry that regulators are going to start seeing firms that participate in the sandbox as the good firms and the firms that don't as the bad firms, right? Like if, you, if you're so good and honest, why didn't you participate in the sandbox? You need to avoid that. That needs to be avoided because that's the type of thing where you, you it, it would be very difficult to root out and you, you have this sort of sub rosa, uh, regulatory benefit. Um, and then, you know, another part of that is participating in a sandbox is arguably evidence of good faith, right? Why would you subject yourself to the Sauronic eye of the regulator if you weren't trying to act in good faith? But that doesn't mean that every firm that doesn't do the sandbox is acting in bad faith. And so if a sandbox firm screws up and they enjoy, you know, the regulator says, okay, look, we're not gonna come down on you like a ton of bricks. We understand you were acting in good faith. Here is the, you know, sort of minor penalty that you'd have to pay. If another firm acting in good faith outside the sandbox makes a similar mistake, it's unclear to me that it would be just to punish that firm anymore, right? If we think about the justifications for punishment, right? You have to actually punish bad acts, to discourage others and to make 
the victims whole. Well, you know, let's let's just sort of stipulate that that we you know making the victims whole is going to happen, or at least that we're going to try. If a firm is acting in good faith out inside the sandbox, it doesn't make sense to punish them as a bad actor. They're not a bad actor. It doesn't make sense to discourage other firms from doing what they did because they're participating in your sandbox. If the firm's outside the sandbox and they're not a bad actor, they just screwed up. Okay, so that prong's the same. Then what you got is well, well, we you know we really want to encourage people to enter the sandbox, and the penalty for not entering the sandbox is is this you know punishment that risks making the sandbox not a voluntary regulatory apparatus, but a mandatory regulatory requirement, which I think would be a, a generally a bad idea, or all you know more than generally a bad idea. So with that, I will I will end it. Thank you so much for your time. So my slide deck uh, doesn't have any uh, graphics or nice pictures, so you're quite boring. It's all words. Uh, so, um, so I probably m I may sound a little bit sort of uh, you know very critical of sandbox, even though. Before I left the CIPB, I designed the CIPB sandbox, and uh, I also led the CIPB's innovation uh, office, and we issued uh, the no action letter to Upstart Network that was under my leadership to, uh, you know, Paul Gu was earlier today on the panel. That was a precursor to a sandbox. Um, uh, and I agree a lot of the things that Brian and uh, Sean uh, talked about earlier, but I also have a lot of disagreements with Brian, and I know you and I will always have a lot of uh, interesting discussions over a cup of coffee or a, a beer. Uh, but hopefully we can we can uh, continue the conversation uh, later on. Uh, so the first time I heard about the, the notion of sandbox uh, was uh, in 2012, November 2012, uh, in the computer computer history museum in um, in, the, in Silicon Valley. We had this uh, um, our uh, the CIPB's uh, you know open house, if you will. Uh, we invited entrepreneurs, venture investors, to come in to to talk to us to 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 to, to tell us was sort of the things that they would the, like the CIPB to do to help promote innovation. I recall sitting at the table uh, across from a, a, a venture investor, I really remember his name or which firm he, he was with. He actually mentioned the word sandbox. He said, well, you know, when we make bets, we, we give little money to the, uh, to the uh, firms and uh, see if they can be successful. If they have tractions, then we'll give them more money. So that's a sandbox. So I wish uh, there was a similar, you know, idea of sandbox in the regulatory structure such that uh, you guys can allow, uh, you know, uh, early stage companies to test new things, test new ideas. So, and, and frankly, that was the, 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 the seed to, in our mind, uh, the start of the No Action Letter Program and the waiver program that CIPB um, uh, uh, implemented over the years before the official sandbox, which was uh, finalized uh, in the summer. Couple of arguments, and some of them I think are kind of interesting, and some are even a little bit laughable in my mind. So, first argument is regulations are lagging behind. We know regulations always lag behind, right? You don't regulate every product, new product, every time you know there's new product comes to market. You don't issue new regulations. Most of the times, the existing regulations would apply. But I agree with this uh, argument that regulations lag behind, um, and uh, this time we are told that. Uh, the regulators will be rendered uh, uh, irrelevant if they don't make any changes. And as a former regulator, I can assure you there are a lot of regulators in the room. You will have a lifetime employment, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, the second thing is the regulations, as, a, as they're today, they're written in the analog age, and they're unfit for the digital revolution. I honestly don't understand what that means, frankly. I always scratch my head when somebody said these uh, very interesting words to me. Um, and obviously the, uh, the implication is lawyers will lose their jobs because uh, we, all we need is the programmers, software engineers to write these codes, the, the regulations in the codes, and uh, the regulations will be self-executed themselves. We don't need compliance people. So there are a lot of lawyers in the room, I'm sure. You will have lifetime employment, I assure you. <laughs> 
The third thing I think I, I, I really uh, resonate a lot with the third argument, which is regulations are impeding financial innovation. Not all regulations, but a lot of regulations are impeding financial regulations. And I really saw firsthand, uh, thinking about back in the days when we issued a letter to Upstart, was really about you know, AI machine learning and also the use of non-traditional data has so much potential to expand access to credit. At the same time, with best intentions, firm want to, firms want to comply, but they don't know how. And just to give you a little bit of secret, back in the days, I have my friends uh, from CFPB sitting in the audience, but you know what I'm talking about, right? In the, back in the days, still, there was very little knowledge. The regulators had very little idea how to deal with these uh, machine learning models and how to actually comply with the spirit of uh, ECOA and the FCRA. Um, so there was a lot of, I believe there was a lot of anxiety back in the days. You know, when I was at Bureau, I, I met with these companies all the time. You know, every time they came to me and said, we want to comply, tell us how. Honestly, I didn't know how, how to comply. Um, basically, I'm not a lawyer, and so I guess I can f <laughs> feel free to say that, but still, there's a lot of uncertainty, and I think it's really important that uh, 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 regulators, regulatory agencies provide more guidance and, uh, and uh, to help these, uh, these new uh, technologies to foster, to, uh, to, uh, um, to help more people. So talking about the goals of the sandbox, so um, the last year I wrote an op-ed on American Banker and I basically laid out two uh, arguments. Um, so there are two things that I think the regulators have tried to deal with, at least when I was at the CFPB, things that I've often thought about. One was the regulatory uncertainty. The other one was regulatory fear. So uncertainty, in my mind, is like the rule is really, really lagging behind. And uh, you know, we know the spirit of the rule or the law, but we don't know how to comp apply it to the existing or the new technologies, new business models. And uh, you know, um, if I have to make, make, uh, take a guess, there's probably less than 10% of the scenarios that we, we, that we that, that when I was dealing with, at the CIPB that actually fall into the regulatory uncertainty uh, uh, area. Uh, I know people, people like, love to talk about regulatory uncertainties, but actually the real uncertainty is very rare. So I think, uh, think about the uh, AI machine learning, uh, how to you know, make uh, the, the models more transparent to comply with FCRA, how to ensure the models are not discriminating against protected classes. I think there's a lot of work that regulators need to do to, uh, to provide more, uh, more, more clarity. So I think that's a true uh, uncertainty. It was before, uh, and it's still true today. Fear is a totally different uh, phenomenon. Um, I can tell you so many times a firm will come to the bureau and say, I really would like to do this. Uh, and my compliance officer has checked all the boxes. So I talked to our, our, uh, our uh, outside uh, council, they also told us you are fully compliant with well, whatever rules that you need to comply with. However, my bank partner says, no, go talk to the CFPB to, think, to ask them what they think. And I, I always will scratch my head. If, 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 if your lawyers have given you a clean health of bill, why, clean, uh, clean bill of health, why do you need the regulator to tell you what to do? But that's the, actually the uncertainty because it's something new. Banks, Compliance officers are always, always very conservative. They always say, what would the regulators think? If thing goes wrong, you know, who's gonna be uh, taking the blame? So I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, I truly think there's a lot of fear in the, in the, in, in, in the space. And, um, and I, I really hope that uh, the regulators in the room can, can, can keep an open mind and work with the supervised entities. And I believe, you know, as much as, as we talk about the disruptive FinTech innovation, I think a lot of the innovation will benefit more people if there's a more bank and non-bank partnerships. The second thing is really about uh, attract investments and create jobs. I think this is really, I believe, the, the primary motivation for a lot of the, you know, developing countries, jurisdictions to develop sandbox just to show that, you know, they have a very, um, uh, you know, their, their regulators are open for business. They want to attract more investments. They want to create more jobs. Um, I recently was uh, consulting with the, um, the foreign central bank and uh, that's really their primary objective. They see what their neighbors are doing, they want to do the same thing. And there's something wrong with it. So the question is really, are sandboxes achieving their stated goals? So here I answer, uh, I, I ask three questions. So are regulators really confusing means and ends? And I think in many cases, 
that's probably true because uh, unfortunately, probably in an effort to attract investments or create more jobs for, uh, for the local economy, um, many sandboxes are just nothing, are nothing but a shiny toy or, uh, or a marketing uh, 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 scheme. So there's not much substance in there. Uh, that's very unfortunate. I think their sandbox can have a lot of potential to do you know, real things. Um, and the second thing is really what have we learned from those experiments, right? So the, to Brian's point, you know, you provide certain privilege to certain participants in your sandbox. They get all the benefit and uh, you share the data, they share the data with you, you learn a lot. Are you going to publish these learnings? If you're not, then what's the point of running sandboxes or experiments? Um, thirdly, we can probably talk about the challenges faced by the sandbox in the US. So we have, what, three state sandboxes at this, as of now, right? Um, we have seven proposed. Seven proposed, right. So um, we haven't heard anything from California or New York, uh, sandbox proposed in California and New York. But uh, I think we pretty much know, you know, these two states are the, the uh, you know, the, uh, the source of the most innovations in the country. Um, including financial innovation. Um, smaller states want to get ahead of the game and uh, the challenge is, you know, you can get a license or you can waive the license requirements for you to those states, but what's the impact, right? So you, you get, you get a, a trial run in, in Arizona or in Utah, uh, do you think the New York regulators would really care about the, the, the results that you have achieved? And by the way, uh, there's one thing that Brian, um, I think I can disagree with you the motivation for applying for a sandbox is to, you know, sort of saving the cost of getting a license. But I think if you're a fintech company, if you, you know, financial services, and if you cannot afford a licensing fee, you shouldn't be in this business in the first place, in my view. Uh, I think that most of the licensing requirements, uh, in, in, by and large, in most of the states are reasonable. Of course, getting licensed in all 50 states is a big challenge. But if you want to really get started in one or two, one or two states, uh, the, the licensing itself is not the issue. Um, uh, so that's why I, I think I, this is very different from the UK, by the way. The FC has a very different licensing requirements. In, at times, it can be very onerous. So for them to waive certain licensing requirements, I think makes sense. But uh, I think in the US, many states actually have a very reasonable licensing requirements. So it's not really a, 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 a sort of a barrier for entry. Um, and at the, C, at the CFPB, obviously, their sandbox, their, their, the, 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 the challenge they're faced with is, and I agree with you, Brian, on the, uh, on the three statutes that uh, they, they, they believe they have uh, full jurisdiction, um, probably, you know, I know states don't like the, the word preemption. I'm not gonna use that word, but um, at the same time, there are state laws that CFPB cannot preempt, right? So look at just what happened to the Apple card uh, over the weekend. Uh, so uh, there's, there's a alleged discrimination against uh, gender, gender discrimination. So who actually announced the investigation? Not the CFPB, but New York, New York DFS. And New York DFS obviously uh, is doing so based on their state law on consumer protection and also on, you know, uh, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which is very similar to the federal ECOA that CFPB has jurisdiction over. But these are two separate laws. So if that's just for the sake of argument, Goldman Sachs got a letter from the CFPB uh, that doesn't really stop New York DFS or any other state from, you know, investigating them on a similar violations, uh, sorry, on the same conduct, but it's, you know, uh, obviously uh, 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 under different uh, uh, legal jurisdiction. So a few sort of uh, uh, I, uh, uh, ideas or uh, some advice for regulators to who want to support innovation? I believe all the regulators want to support innovation or responsible consumer-friendly innovation. I do believe the, uh, the sort of the hub model probably uh, is a much lower cost and, uh, and, uh, um, um, and, and it can be very effective. Um, so over the five years uh, when I was at Bureau, I probably met with close to a thousand companies. And uh, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I also give people legal advice, whatever that means. <laughs> um, it's not legal advice, but I think unofficial advice can be very helpful. Some firms come in, they just, they just don't know what to do. You know, they have, they have, they have very basic questions they want to ask you. They cannot really afford, you know, 
um, a uh, expensive lawyer to, to help them do the research. And um, I understand there's a sort of an uneven playing field, but I think, unfortunately, financial services, this industry is kind of an uneven playing field to, playing field to start with because uh, all the regulators you know, supervise the banks or non-banks, and when your examiner goes to a bank and uh, asks questions, you know, that activity itself is some form of device. You sometimes tell the banks this is something they shouldn't do, and this advice only stays with the bank, not with other bank, other banks. So, uh, so I think the, the playing field is not really e uh, even to start with. And uh, I personally think, especially when you deal with very innovative startups, uh, it is really the regulator's job to to provide, I would call it free advice, if you will, uh, because this advice doesn't really require you know hours of hours of research, um, and it really can can ensure these startups are not doing anything stupid down the road and wasting their money and their effort and their investors' money and, and harming consumers. So I do think the kind of uh, even unofficial advice can be really, really useful and helpful. Uh, but more importantly, I think it is really uh, a regulator's job to, uh, to provide very clear rules of the road. Uh, so um, if the rules are clear, you don't need the sandboxes, right? Why would you need the sandboxes? If the rules are clear, you know, you just follow the rules. And if you follow the rules, nobody should go after you. Um, um, but I think, obviously, we're not doing enough in the space. And uh, I, I, I think most of the rules in this country are pretty prescriptive. Uh, but there are a few that are, you know, um, you know principle-based, like uh, ECOA or UDAP. Uh, I think there are a lot of, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's some, some room for improvement, if you will, for regulators to provide more guidance in, in that space. And thirdly, I think, again, going back to you know, the, some of the points that Sean and, and Brian mentioned earlier, running experiments are great, you know, but do not run the experiments for the sake of running experiments. Uh, and the, the, the trap that I think uh, regulatory agencies tend to uh, get into is really innovation by permission. Right? Innovation should be permissionless. If there's innovation, real innovation, as long as you, you, you follow the rules, you should be able to do it on your own. You don't need someone to tell you you can do this. Um, so uh, I really, you know, this is something that I'm, I've been really worried about that, uh, you know, I recently wrote about uh, the CFPB's uh, uh, sandbox or the Noah Center program. Um, you know, if Upstart got a letter, should, should another AI machine learning company apply for the same letter that Upstart received? And my answer is, you know, I think no, shouldn't. I think the CFPB has already done this very great experiment with Upstart. Um, it's really upon the CFPB to publish the, the, the lessons learned so that everybody can benefit instead of just one company or a few more companies. So regular, reg, uh, innovation by permission is something that I think uh, all the agencies that are running uh, sandboxes should be very aware of. And the last but not the least is really about keep an open mind um, and be willing to take some risk. Um, I think the, the typical regulatory response to, uh, to a question posed by uh, 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 financial service company, bank or non-bank, is always silence. You know, you don't say anything. Sometimes because you don't know the answers, which is under, uh, understandable. Sometimes we know the answers, but we just, not we. The regulators uh, feel reluctant to give the answer. And I think the, you know, the reason is very simple. There's no upside, right? If things go wrong, when you provide the answer, who's going to take the blame? The regulator. Everything's turned out to be great. You know, you don't take a profit share from the great venture that the firm actually uh, 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 engages in. So, but I think with, with so many things that are happening, uh, it is really important for the regulators to keep an open mind. Sometimes staying silent, staying, uh, not saying anything, that, that's also a form of risk taking. Uh, so that's not really helpful. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Matt. Thank you. So I don't have slides. It's my role to uh, uh, wear the industry hat and comment on uh, the work of all of these uh, uh, fantastic academics and former regulators. Um, and I also am sitting between us and drinks, so I'll be short. Um, I, I do think that there's a couple of um, points uh, that were raised, and my own thinking about sandboxes has evolved from one where, you know, when I first heard this concept getting introduced, I said, 
well, this is fantastic. This is a place where all these innovative companies, we all support entrepreneurship, we all support innovation. This is a place where innovative companies can go and get these tough questions answered um, without hiring an army of lawyers, um, without conducting a 50 state survey, without, you know, this is this, is this great, you know, magical way to get answers and, and move past some of these, um, you know, pain points of trying to figure things out. Um, but my thinking has evolved to where I really believe that the value of sandboxes and no action letters is really um, with the regulators, right? The value is actually that regulators have the ability to do what I would call trust but verify, right? So we all had been hearing over you know many years the potential for alternative data and AI to expand, um, you know, who can be approved for credit and at what price. And there are probably some studies out there uh, that suggested it, but until Upstart, you know, at least in the United States that I'm aware of, until Upstart went to the CFPB and actually allowed the CFPB to run the models alongside them and do the testing for fair lending and show just what, per that, you know, over the course of mo many years, 27% more people could be approved and that the pricing could be improved by 16%. So in other words, people that wouldn't have been 27%, people wouldn't have been uh, approved for prime credit are now getting prime credit and people's credit is being reduced in pricing in APR by 16%. Those findings would, would have possibly been published by an academic. And I think you know there's been very credible work done by Jalapa and others with Lending Club. Um, that's very important work that shows similar departure from FICO and yet the ability to, to approve credit and improve. But the government wouldn't have done the work, right? So in the words of Ronald Reagan, the idea of trust but verify, this idea that a regulator can verify in partnership with an industry participant provides, I think, more of a rationale for regulators then to undertake the very painstaking, difficult interagency work of, for instance, updating guidance to banks around the use of alternative data, which you know is something that I think the GAO, as I referenced this morning, the GAO has recommended and that I think the regulators are gonna undertake. And I think the work that the CFPB did and Dan did with, with Upstart really provided that kind of extra verification for why that work may be necessary. Because there are these questions out there, uh, especially by the supervised entities, about whether they can, you know, at least in part, move on beyond a, a purely FICO-based model to use some of these alternative techniques. So that's kind of the first point I want to make, that I think that the benefits of sandboxes accrue mostly to the regulators in verifying um, you know, some of the trends and things and the desire to keep up and to make the regulations promote innovation and, and promote consumer protection. So um, that's the first point. I think the other point is one where um, regulation, you know, ideally in, in a fragmented regulated regulatory structure, if a company goes to the regulator of jurisdiction on a set of laws like, you know, Upstart goes to the CFPB to work on, um, fair lending and ECOA and, and alternative data and, and AI and uh, machine learning, that the other regulators would provide some sort of recognition, right? So one of the reasons why, again, I think that the benefits accrue mostly to the regulators rather than to the regulated is that there isn't a great system when we have, you know, the Fed, the OCC, and the FDIC who supervise for safety and soundness, and the, the Fed also does, you know, consumer protection work in addition to the CFPB, and yet there's not really a formal mechanism where the no action letter that's provided to Upstart is even formally recognized in any way by other regulators, right? And so that creates a challenge when, you know, the, one of the whole goals of, of going and pursuing the no action letter is to try to get that kind of um, recognition in the market that there's a technique here that is compliant and that can expand the, you know, the number of people that you can approve. And, you know, by the way, the goal of the company is to partner with banks, right? So that, that lack of a, of a multi you know, sort of regulator approval means that the, the value in a fragmented regulatory structure of a no action process or a sandbox is always going to be limited to the regulator um, sort of that you're specifically working with. And I think that there are ways that regulators could address that issue um, and, and provide for more mutual recognition or at least, you know, provide for some sort of a, um, a situation in which that, that if, if you get a no action letter, if you get through a sandbox program and get an approval from one regulator, that that provides some sort of, uh, you know, acceleration in, in recognition by other regulators for a process or, or, or so forth. Um, the final point I think on state, so one of the challenges that was raised was, was state, the states, right? We have a federal structure, we have federal regulators who can provide 
um, what limited relief, um, but they can learn a lot uh, from these stand boxes and all of that is fantastic. But if the regulator in uh, New York State doesn't see eye to eye with the CFPB's process, then there's not much, you know, security gained if the if the state regulator can, you know, come down hard based on some minor slip up or or whatever. I think the establishment of a of a uh, of a state sandbox in every state would be fantastic because I think that we have, you know, an internet-based model that could benefit everyone across the country and very different state laws, licensing regimes, regulatory requirements that are in fact, you know, you talk about licensing, it's sometimes difficult working with states to figure out what licenses do apply to what you're doing. It's not just the difficulty of applying and getting licenses in 50 states, it's just the, the, the licenses often don't apply to the internet era. Um, and so there's a there's a value in states, I think, establishing sandboxes because um, they would have an ability to say, hey, look, your state is an anomaly um, because we do this in all of these other states. And yet, because of this anomaly in your law, your regulatory regime, your approach, this product, this offering isn't available here. Might you let us test it out, right? We're not trying to get full, we're not trying to flip you from right now a hard no to a hard yes but we think we could document, and I'll give you an example. So um, if everybody watched the World Series, I don't know, I'm a baseball fan, so I, I watched the World Series, and there are a lot of commercials um, with people that are in a lot better shape than, than I am riding Peloton bikes. So I don't know if everybody saw these Peloton commercials during the World Series, but um, they basically were advertising a, a very affordable solution, um, you know, where for however much a month you can, you can have a Peloton bike, and that's a product that, um, one of my members uh, approves uh, a firm, uh, helps Peloton at the point of sale uh, provide financing. And the financing is provided by Cross River Bank, another MLA, another MLA member. But right down there in the fine print, it says product not available in the states of Iowa and West Virginia, right? So in 48 states, you can get a Peloton bike. And I don't think it's because Peloton doesn't think people in Iowa or West Virginia like to do stationary cycling. Maybe, maybe that's the case. But I think it's probably the case that there's an anomaly in those two states that's made it difficult to run an internet-based point of sale option, even though, as Scott laid out this morning, a third of the loans are 0% APR. There are no fees, there are no hidden fees, there's no catches in this product. It's as simple as financing can get. And all of the lend lending is done below the New Jersey Ritz of Cross River Bank loan, below the 30% rate cap. I mean, this seems like a product that's no-brainer, should be available in every state. How is that not available? You know, we can get a credit card in every state. Why can't we get this? And and yet there are these anomalies in state law. So I think sandboxes would create this opportunity to say, in a regulated environment, in a very controlled environment, to say to a state, let's try to you know let's try to walk before we run. We understand, um, you know, would you like to come in and verify that this product is actually you know helpful to consumers and can be done in compliance with your laws, even though you're not sure it can. So. That's, those are some examples where I think uh, sandboxes um, at the state level can be helpful and some thinking about the value, um, which again, I do believe accrues mostly to the regulators and less necessarily to the, um, to the regulated. So I think actually Dan's point in his op-ed that others shouldn't necessarily follow. It's like because the value of the sandbox actually accrued to the regulatory community to actually verify this hunch that everybody had that this new, these new methods can actually expand access to credit, it isn't necessarily the case that everybody, I mean, it's just unwieldy. The process took so long. It's, uh, there's no way that the whole the whole industry can go to the and get it or you know apply for an identical no action letter um, and everybody's going to have slightly different things, uh, you know, ideas about, you know, the way they run their models and so forth. But they showed that in a principles-based approach and um, the disparate impact testing, you know, under ECOA, they showed that there's a path to compliance. So then that kind of opens the door for others to follow, not into the sandbox, but to actually just feel more comfortable and, and probably, you know, frankly, for the regulatory community to see the path to what, what rules and, and guidance they want to update themselves. Um, so I don't see necessarily, I actually see, I don't see the competitiveness 
problem that Brian does. But again, that's because I see this, my thinking on it has changed from, you know, these, these startups that really need help are gonna get all their questions answered and that's gonna be a big benefit to them to thinking that the real benefit of sandboxes is, is at the regulators. Um, and and not with the firms. So uh, so I just want so I think I do think Brian's concern is very very legit. So if if the benefit is only accrued to let's say in this case Upstart and nobody else actually gets to to do what Upstart has been doing and Upstart basically you know uh, is getting the sort of uh, unfair advantage over its competitors. Um, so I think the the real issue is uh, first of all. Uh, Upstart didn't get this letter for free, so there was, you know, it, it, there's a quid pro quo. You know, Upstart had to do additional things that a a supervised entity uh, doesn't have to do. So they have to do, they have to go above and beyond. So, so, so for the effort they have made to get to to get the uh, the uh, the uh, the protection from the bureau, I think. Uh, uh, at least from their perspective, it's worth it. But I think how long should you keep that uh, just to upstart? And I think that's really where the, the, the question is, the, the competition question is. I think the Bureau should actually publi uh, uh, publicize the, uh, the learning. So if upstart did this X, Y, Z to get where they are today, why do you need another company to go through the same process and apply for the no, same no action natural waiver? Um, and why don't you just, you know, uh, share the information with the public so that everybody can see how Upstart, you know, did it and that they can follow the, the, the same approach. But I think that the, the Brian's slide showed that the CFP no action process, these are techniques that are legal as the, under ECOA, right? So there wasn't any need, like there isn't this special kind of privilege pr provided to Upstart and if you then disclose their proprietary information, um, you, you know, potentially dis you know, disclose their proprietary information, then you know, you, I think, dissuade people from helping the government get, again, as the, the benefits, con con you know, conferring to the government, like you, you, you hurt their ability to kind of start to understand and verify some of these new ideas and concepts. Um, there, you know, Brian Slide said it best, none of the things were, you're not getting a, a free pass from something where you're gonna be vi violating a code. In fact, like, you have to be in compliance with the code to be in the program. Okay, Brian. Okay, so as the author of that slide, <laughs> The, the, I, I think the challenge is that it depends on how facts and circumstances specific the analysis is. So like an ACOA fair lending analysis is incredibly facts and circumstances specific, right? You can come in and say, they used upstart used algorithms, we're going to use algorithms. Okay, well, what do your algorithms say? If Canadian, no loan. Hmm, that might be a problem with the national origin prong of ACOA, right? It's how does your algorithm act? when it meets the real world. And that's very facts and circumstances specific. And that's the type of, of, of scenario where I think, I think, like, look, I think I have very conflicted emotions about regulatory sandboxes. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, 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 they are not a panacea. They are not a one size fits all tool. But I think one area where they're actually very well suited is this type of intense facts and circumstances analysis where it's like, okay, Let's try it out on a real body of, of, of people and let's see if there is a uh, disparate impact, if, if there's any disparate impact apparent. And if there isn't, th th then we can, you know, give you the, then we can say, well, you're in compliance with ACOA, right? The, the CFPB presumably is going to do the analysis, you know, and then, and then grant the approval, right? They're not going to say like, yeah, you're, you have disparate impact out the wazoo, we approve, right? That, that's, and so, and part, I mean, part of it is gonna be, you need to have that experiment. Now, not everything is that facts and circumstances specific, right? If it's like, hey, we wanna settle securities on the blockchain, after the first couple go, then you can say, all right, fine, here are some, here are some general rules about it. But for very fact specific issues, you may, you, each firm may need to, to get the benefits, may need to go. Now, I agree with you that you don't want to reveal proprietary information, but the regulators can reveal and should reveal their learnings, right? So you don't necessarily disclose Upstart's algorithm, that would be a disaster. But you can say, look, we, the CFPB, here's the analysis we did. Here is at a, at a certain level of abstraction, the facts we faced, and here's how it went. So you, you know, Downstart can look at that and say, and, and at least get a, a you know, a, a downshift. Down there, look, you, finding URLs is hard nowadays, <laughs> right? So it's like, <laughs> 
you can at least have a, a, a head start on your analysis because, you know, the analysis that the regulator does is not in a strictly economic sense, but I'd argue it's kind of a public good, right? Like taxpayers paid for that. And so it should be, to the greatest extent available, or possible, available to the public. What, str what struck me this morning was that Paul was talking about his relationship directly with the regulators, um, mostly focusing, I think, on the bank regulators, um, who we haven't, hasn't really been part of our sandbox discussion. Are, are there any actual sandboxes that involve bank regulators and safety and soundness, or is that just not part of the... No, there are innovation offices where you can come and get questions answered. I think the OCC is sort of launching a sandbox-like um, uh, you know, opportunity, but I think that a pilot program, right? So um, the, I think the challenge is, again, that I reference is you can go to one regulator and you, you're not necessarily, the, the, the learnings don't always translate in a fragmented regulatory structure the way they should over to, because, and this is the way, you know, to, to a safety and soundness regulator, you know, a fair lending or a consumer protection violation, like it, you, you would say, well, it shouldn't be their jurisdiction, but everything can become a reputational issue for the bank, which can then become a safety and soundness issue, right? So there becomes a safety and soundness overlay to everything. And so if you only have, if the CFPB is the only one that has the sandbox and the rest of the regulators aren't giving the CFPB the credit that they should for being able to do math, then you're gonna have a, a you know, a, a fragmented, you know, lack of, you know, lack of put the, the maximal benefit that you could get out of this. So I think, if nothing else, for instance, the banking uh, regulators could could um, list the names of companies that have you know are completing a sandbox program or a no action letter program, you know, in their own examination manuals, right? Like they could say, you know, uh, part of their quarterly update is like here's who's gone through the CFPB's process, just to provide some formal recognition, because otherwise you feel as though you're you're talking to regulators from Venus, and then all of a sudden the regulators from Mars show up. Yeah, I, mean, I think the, the issue is even bigger at, at sort of uh, when it comes to federal versus state, you know, because uh, we have 50 states. Uh, again, this is not a sort of, you know, a criticism of, of any specific regulator, uh, but it's, it's, you know, every state have their own, their, their own rules and laws, and uh, they, may, they, they may look very different from uh, the, the, the rules on the books with the CAPB or, the, or, or with the Prudentials. So, you know, this is really a big challenge in terms of coordination among different regulator, regulatory agencies, even with, with Upstart. Uh, so, you know, one of the reasons it took so long was really, part of the reason was really about regulatory coordination. So we have to talk to different, you know, agency to make sure, you know, they are, they are, they are, they are aware you know, in well in advance aware that this is something the CFPB would like to do and to brief them, educate them, you know, the things we'd like to do and hopefully they can, you know, be on the same page. So, so Sean had a, a slide with a, um, w with his forecast for the future. I'm curious what, 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 what you guys thought of, of, of that. He, he said there's going to be thematic, there's going to be maybe a policy oriented like Singapore had. What, what, do you, what do you guys see? Where do you see sandboxes going? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, what what the upstart conversation points out is that there's there is, and, and one question I actually had on that is you know, we didn't ask how how did upstart come to be part of the program? Like, what what was the concern that they were trying to resolve by approaching the CFPB or vice versa? Was it an affirmative block? Was it they were trying to raise money? Was it like what's the narrative into the sandbox? I think that's an interesting question we could talk about separately. Um, but I think I think it shows a good point. Like you know, th there is basically an information gap about machine learning algos and you know directionally which way they point, and some some regulatory question about uh, their capability to you know as assess those for you know uh, under existing regulatory regimes. And you could certainly see a, a thematic sandbox around uh, around credit writing, credit underwriting based on machine learning, right? And uh, a thematic sandbox about stress testing algos for different things, whether it's systemic risk, whether it's uh, underwriting risk and so forth. Um, but that's, I think, the, 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 you know, the changing nature of a regulatory capability using, you know, essentially evaluation of digital evidence in a, in a different way. So I, I think one thing that, that's gonna point us towards this thematic sandbox is at least in the United States, is how fractured and divided our regulatory environment is, right? Because you know you don't have like a Twin Peaks or a single peak model where all financial services are regulated by one entity. We have, you know, I, I don't even want to try to count, right? So to the extent you're gonna have 
a, a sandbox in the security space. It's going to be the SEC, and the theme is going to be the SEC's themes. How do you have orderly markets? How do you facilitate capital uh, formation? How do you protect investors, right? And they're not going to care about lending because that's not what they do. Uh, you know, the CFPB is going to be intensely focused on are you hurting consumers? Because and, – and the, you know, consumer – a, a relatively, but not not with securities, not with commodities, but otherwise, like, look, is it a consumer-facing product, and are you hurting consumers? And the banks are going to care about, look, is this the type of thing a bank, or bank regulators are going to care about, it's the type of thing a bank regulates. And then at the state level, I think you're going to have specialization. So, I mean, one example that was raised here, the SEC with the, the blockchain company? We're really close oh. to time, so maybe quick? I was only going to say that the SEC, you know, ever so much operates through exemptions, right? So there's this kind of irony that the SEC's process is a little bit because, you know, everything is, you know, is, is actually denied until it's expressly permitted in, 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 in the world of uh, securities regulation. And so um, the, that, that, I think, that sort of freedom is a little bit, I think, a, a creature of the SEC's rules where they're, they're kind of contemplating should there be an exemption around some of these new blockchain areas and so they're, they're willing to kind of, you know, b sort of put a temporary hold on, uh, you know, an enforcement process because of the unique nature of securities law. So I, unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you very much, guys.